Cool. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Boyd Hooper. I think you already know that. So uh, the presentation tonight is designed to be pretty informal. Going to be talking about what we do and, and some of the technologies around uh, rearing pups uh, for better confidence, resilience and social competence. Obviously, with a priority for you guys on if they don't make it in the race game or whatever, that um, they can be rehomed later um, more effectively. And uh, obviously, without countering obviously anything that you guys are doing if anything i think it should pretty much enhance it because if a dog is more confident more resilient then uh, that can only help to be honest in a racing sort of scenario i'm happy to take questions at any time i'm not going to go through an intro on myself i sent through a bit of a cv and i believe you guys have been advised on who i am and what my background is and as i say i've been in it for a long time i act as a consultant for numerous agencies around australia on exactly this topic and others okay so consultant for border force with their breeding programs with their labradors and uh, many of the police agencies both here and overseas and the like and i've been a breeder and trainer myself for many decades so without further ado happy to take questions at any time just uh, interrupt kirsty if anybody sends um anything on the chat okay um can you monitor that for me and I won't worry about monitoring it. And if there is a question on the chat, you can just read it out for us as though you're them and just represent them for us. That means I don't have to monitor the chat while I'm giving the presentation. Yep, sounds good. Okay, so I wanna to make tonight's presentation as much as possible, a combination of the scientific knowledge that we've gained over the last well, 70 years as a whole, but I'm gonna focus on the, on the last 20 years and also practical experience making it real world so we're not making it too too dry from a scientific point of view okay so uh look i'm a big believer in really understanding the details on a presentation like this we can't delve too far into the details but um there are a couple of things when we'll get into the weeds a little bit because it'll help you understand a few dynamics and then i'm going to offer as many practical tips without making life difficult for people like do this like a prescription and say if you could do this at this time that will make a big difference and if you can do that at this time that'll make a big difference okay all right so um this is from andrew huberman very well-known neuroscientist out of stanford runs his own podcast called the huberman podcast and his own lab at stanford why do we have fear why do we have trauma why do we have shame here's the stinger it was all set up during your youth when you're young, you're just a passive learning machine and it's all coming in. Little kids are learning three languages without, with no accents flexibly. They're not even thinking about it. How come when you're older, it's so much tougher? There's a lot of biology that explains why it all shuts down after the so-called critical periods in development. Um, some of the slides I'm just going to put up, you can take a photo of them or this is being recorded so you can go back. Some of the slides are really back just for reference. So if you want to understand a little bit more, the slides are there, but I'm not going to go into them. The way to understand it is we all, we've all we all heard of the, the term neuroplasticity, the brain plasticity that now brain plasticity is immensely more uh, able to learn new things when, when we are young, both humans and dogs, but most particularly in dogs. And certainly what we've learned over the last 20 years is that there are some really early critical windows that make a huge difference in development. And it's not necessarily what you might have heard because the research that was done originally by Scott and Fuller and others back in the uh, 1950s around that period and published heavily through the 50s and the 60s, uh, while it was a great start and fundamentally got us on the right track about early development, it certainly wasn't on the money and uh, we've learned a lot of lot since then particularly in the last 20 years so I want to bring that up to date okay so um, a good way of looking at it from a very well respected professor of psychology and neuroscience Lisa Feldman Barrett is that infant brains are not like miniature adult brains it's wiring isn't completely finished what the infant do, is doing to some extent is that they're waiting for a set of wiring instructions from the world. The brain expects certain inputs in order for it to wire itself normally, and it wires itself to both the physical circumstances it grows up in, but also the social circumstances. Now, it's a good idea for me to say now that um, 
we are breeders and um, we are also trainers. And so we have definitely a foot in both camps, which is good because breeders often tend to be more orientated towards genetics and trainers more orientated towards the environment. And I have not only do I have decades of experience in both, I actually have formal qualifications in both. I studied genetics at Melbourne Uni and uh, I have various qualifications in training and, and the like, as well as you know, setting up a lot of courses and running a lot of programs. So uh, right from the outset, I want to say that as much as is possible, I'm not biased in either direction, or if I am, I'm just biased in both directions. So for me, both genetics and environment are really important. And I don't think you can get great dogs without both. The thing I will say, and it's very relevant to you guys, is that the more specialised the task, the more genetics matters, okay? So if you want a, a fast-running dog like a greyhound, genetics matters enormously. If you want a, a great herding dog like a Border Collie or a Kelpie, genetics matters enormously, okay? Uh, if you don't have a really targeted job in mind, then genetics matters less and the environment matters more, okay? Now, by default... Once we start getting into these specialist tasks like runners, you know, racing dogs like you guys are into and herding dogs or for border force, they're detector dogs and, and things. And we also work with assistance dogs agencies for disabled people and, and that sort of stuff. And obviously the law enforcement military dogs, they're all specialists and there's breeding, not only of particular breeds, but also particular strains of those dogs for those particular tasks. Now that's great. And they get very good at their task but it means that they're usually not that good at other things. So even if you get a working Kelpie or a working water collie, it's usually not great at most other jobs, like being a pet, a family pet, for example. Uh, there, there's sometimes you get cross-pollination, so maybe a good working uh, water collie might also be a, a good detector dog because it, those drives can be sort of transferred. Never going to be as good if you, if you don't breed the dog specifically for the task. So... It's only natural that because you guys are so focused on your breeding for a very specialised task, running fast, um, that there's going to be compromises in other traits, most notably human sociability and being able to get on in the modern world. Let's call it pet dog behaviours and traits, okay? Um, so there's nothing much we can do about yeah. that because you're obviously not going to compromise on your breeding. You're not going to pick a slightly slower dog because he looks like he'll be better at, fa at being a family pet. You're always going to breed with the fastest and the best that you can get, as are everybody in the working and service dog community, a la sled dogs, herding dogs, etc. okay, every area. We're always going to breed for the best, and we do too, okay? Most of our dogs would be terrible. Our dogs that we work with, Belgian Malinois, Dutch Shepherds, German Shepherds, and uh, our Spaniels and Labs and things like that, uh, most, for the most part, terrible pets, okay? They're just absolutely nightmare because they're, you know, single-purpose, super-focused dogs like yours. So we're in the same camp, and we, we understand the same dynamic, and uh, we, we work around it. So to the point, what that means is that if you are breeding a dog for a very targeted function like racing or police dogs or whatever we're talking about, detector dogs or whatever, and you're really committed to it, I'm a believer that the only thing that produces high performance is militant selection. You've got to be militant about it. There's no compromises, okay? Only the best of the best from a breeding perspective. And anybody who knows me and knows my background in breeding will say, that's why he's so pedantic and uh, don't breed enough. I probably don't breed enough litters because unless everything is exactly the way I want it to be, I'm just not prepared to compromise. That sounds good, but it ends up meaning you don't get a lot of litters on the ground. So the point I want to make from this is that because you guys are not selecting for other traits, family pet traits and the like, and even, you know, to be able to cope in the real world and those types of things, just like thoroughbred breeders are with their horses and stuff like that, it means that there'll be compromises in the genetic you know, genetic uh, structure of those dogs for uh, and the cognitive architecture, the brain for those other roles. You've you've designer built these dogs for your task, okay? And that, by definition, that means they won't be good at other things, such as a family pet. Now, the problem that you guys have more so than others, although it is, you guys cop the flack of it 
when I can tell you that the same situation applies because the military, when they're breeding their dogs, Australian military as well, well as elsewhere, and the police. Um, <laughs> let me give you a quick case study. We had a dog come yesterday, a German Shepherd, 16 months old. Zuko is his name, uh, a reject from the police department uh, because he didn't make the grade, not drive enough, okay? You know, doesn't want to play the game enough, so he's not going to hunt properly for them, not going to work properly, okay? Other than that, not a bad dog. Okay, now that dog then went to a family home for a short period of time. They couldn't live with him, just a nightmare, just way too much dog, way too hectic, you know, reactive towards other dogs, all sorts of what we would consider reasonably minor behavioural problems, but really difficult to live with, okay? The net result is doesn't make it for its work job, okay? In your case, that's racing. In this case, we're talking about a police dog. Doesn't make it as a family pet because he's just too much dog because he was built as a working dog and he's sort of stuck between two worlds. And, and you can see the analogy there with you guys. It's not identical because we're talking police versus racing, but the, the principle is the same, okay? So, the net result of that is that what are we going to do about that process? Well, that's what I'm here tonight to talk about. Since we can't breed for exactly what we want from, from a family pet, because our priority here is racing and working dogs, what we've got to do then is we've got to compensate with the right environment. Okay. And the that means that in order to compensate for genetics that aren't designed for a task, uh, you have to do extra work in the environment as a compensatory protocol. So somebody who's breeding, you know, golden retrievers, for example, can probably get away with a mediocre early developmental environment and still produce pretty good family pets because those dogs haven't, for the most part, been selectively bred for traits that are counterproductive to being a family pet unlike our police dogs and your racing dogs, which have been selectively bred for traits that would, as a rule, be counterproductive or at least not conducive to being a good family pet. Okay, so... so sorry, was that a question there? No? No, okay. I think that is not on mute. Yeah, on pop yourself on mute, guys, just so as we don't hear the talking in the background. Otherwise, I'm not sure if you're going to ask a question. If you do want to ask a question, just come off mute. Okay, so even from a human perspective, guys, uh, I'll read this from Nim Tottenham, um, very famous uh, developmental researcher. Why do we care so much about early experiences? There's a lot of reasons. One of them is the presence of sensitive periods during early life. Sensitive periods are those times when the brain is first developing, when a certain brain system is particularly amenable to be influenced by the environment. A brain region may take on certain biological properties that make it highly plastic and ready to be changed, shaped, sculpted by the experience the individual has. If you see a metaphor, this window of opportunity uh, or vulnerability of the, of the system, the window at some point closes as we mature. Now, that's the key point that I want to take home here, guys. The window at some point closes as we mature. So the phenotypic expression or the way we behave and the way that our brain functions... Uh, reflects the environmental influences that occur during that sensitive period. So that's even in humans, okay? So Nim, Nim is primarily a human child researcher, but this is way more important in dogs. Now, for some of you, that's probably old news. You've probably heard of sensitive and critical periods. You know that dogs need to be socialised. If we go back, you know, 50 plus years, the belief was that we the critical period was sort of 13 to 12 weeks or, thir uh, sorry, three to 12 weeks of age, or sometimes it was talked about as four to 16 weeks in that sort of zone. Now, that's yes. a bit of a misreading and a misinterpretation of the uh, of the literature from the past. Um, I think it's a convenient one because it let breeders off the hook. They, they tended to think, well, I'm going to get rid of my pups at six weeks or seven weeks or eight weeks. <clears throat> so I can just leave all that socialisation to the... Um, to the, to the new owners and the like but uh that's in fact dead wrong um and if you look closely at the literature you realize it is wrong but that's been consolidated in the last 20 years with a lot of new research to find out that really most what, of the work of the really base um goes back to the um breeder uh, for, for better or worse so the breeder really controls the outcomes okay um, yeah yes Guys, several of you still are not on mute and we're getting a lot of talk over. So can you just have a look down the bottom on your control panel there, guys? It's usually in the bottom left-hand corner and just mute yourself because I can hear every word that everybody's saying coming over the top and it's um, 
I'm not sure whether you're asking questions, but it's certainly distracting for everybody. Please get yourself. Yep, there's somebody talking again. I'll just say quickly one week at a time at the moment. <laughs> But say it's one thing that happens for you over. So you... The, the person who's saying one thing to happen is the person who's doing the voiceover. Whoever it, who just said there's only one thing, I'm taking it one day at a time or something like that. We're hearing every word that you say. Please mute yourself. Okay. Um, so as I said, even in humans, um, we have these sharply defined critical periods and in dogs, it's even stronger. Okay, and I, I stag, state again, guys, don't worry if you're not reading all these slides. We are recording it. We knew that we were recording it. So I thought I'll put in some extra information for those that want to go back over and watch the video and then they can get more references and more information. Okay, I don't need to deliver all this. It's the point that I want to bring across and this is just extra information. Okay, so um, the point being is that we've really got to uh, deal with this thing in early stages, okay, and uh, early development. And the thing we've realised, particularly over the last 15 years, since sort of the mid noughties there, is that we actually need to do a fair bit more, but the big thing is we need to actually start a lot earlier than was originally uh, expected, okay? So a lot of people kind of think that you can start socialising your pup at eight weeks or seven weeks and everything will be fine. Um, and certainly one reading of the early research and stuff implied that to some degree, even though it always talked about it started at three or four weeks, okay? People sort of said, well, that's when it starts. But if I don't start when it starts, I can play catch up by starting at seven or eight weeks. And as it turns out, that's not right. Uh, in fact, it's sort of back to front. OK, uh, as it turns out, the really important points uh, timings are the early periods. And I'm going to give you a graph on showing you that. OK, um, but there's all sorts of um, identification. Now, this if you're looking for further research and reading, this is probably a relevant one to you guys, because it's a study um, looking at exactly the kind of situations that you're in, including pup behaviour using new standardised socialisation program. So having a, a sort of a bit of a doctrine to say this is going to be the protocol. And perhaps, I, I'm not going to talk about this tonight, but perhaps you guys could, and I'd be happy to work with you to develop something, have a recommended protocols and procedures for your dogs that you promote throughout the entire industry and say, okay, this is the type of prescription that we recommend for our pups. So, you know, one week of age, they're doing this, at two weeks, they're doing this, right the way through, okay? And particularly around the three, four, five, and six week of age, um, we have quite a lot of protocols and procedures that we do that virtually inoculate the dog from all the common problems, fears, anxieties, separation problems and everything. And it pretty much does it for life, okay? So it's a, almost a one-stop shop. If you get it all right in those early development weeks, okay, particularly between sort of, depending on the breed, but somewhere between three and seven or four to eight weeks of age, that's when all the heavy lifting is done. I want to say that again, between three and seven or four and eight, depending on the breed, is when all the heavy lifting is done. So effectively, by the time the dog traditionally leaves the breeder, most of the heavy lifting should be done. That means socialization, environmental exposure, environmental conditioning, excursions, uh, noises, people, etc. Okay. There's a great quote from the veterinary behaviorist Ian Dunbar that says, you want to inoculate your dog against fear of humans. It should be handled by, not just meat, but handled by a hundred people before eight weeks of age and another hundred by 16 weeks of age, okay? Now that's pretty extreme, but I'm suggesting again that because you guys are not breeding for human sociability, you're breeding for fast dogs, you need to do more work during the early environment than what the average breeder would. And particularly for somebody who's breeding dogs where they're consciously selecting for those human social traits and environmentally stable traits, which like the thoroughbred breeders, as a rule, you guys are not. Okay, so if you're not going to breed for the traits, then you have to compensate by environment. And unfortunately, or fortunately, however you want to look at it, that means a lot of early work for the young dogs. Okay, and um, really getting it all sorted out early is the important point. Okay, um, it's the same thing for social imprinting. Okay, so I'm putting it in a collective bucket here <clears throat> human social 
bonding and relating um, and also environmental conditioning. So unusual surfaces, unusual noises, newness and novelty and unfamiliar. So when the dog goes out, new things that's not familiar with don't spook it uh, and pretty much anything and everything you can think of in the environment. All of those things are important early. And again, a misreading of the literature, people thought that they could do the socialization early, like a lot of human handling, but they didn't have to take their dog out on excursions. They didn't have to environmentally expose their dogs when they were young. And that, again, is dead wrong. Okay. And it's particularly dead wrong if you're not breeding for dogs that are that way inclined. So you're breeding for other traits, then you have to do the extra work. And I reiterate again the more specific the task, the more the genetics matter. So you guys are the king of that, as are the herding guys, uh, as are the sled pulling guys, you know, all these fully, in, you know, really high end um, working examples, working dog examples. And as a result of that, uh, you, the traits that you have selected for are not going to be conducive to being rehomed in social environments. So we can compensate, but it takes a lot of work. Okay, and it takes a lot of work early. Okay, sorry to tell you the news, but it's got to be one or the other. It should be both with all with every dog. It should be both. But when you're selecting for a highly skilled, highly specialized task, you can't be selecting at the same time for, you know, nice social family pets because you you do one thing, you compromise another. Okay, so um, so the psychosocial attachment, we want it to happen in the early periods when the emotional attachment occurs and the in initial approach tendency enables uh, the animal to establish a close emotional bond with its mother and members of its own species and other species, including humans. So plenty of, uh, you know, up close and personal social skills when the dogs are very young. So we do handling like this basically from day one from birth, but certainly it shouldn't start any later than the second or third day. And we like a lot of nuzzling like this up into the nap of the neck and getting the human odor and spending really quality time uh, with the dogs. And so um, I'm not sure how viable that is for you guys. Okay. But I'm here to talk about what should happen and what produces optimal and what solves problems. The logistics of how you apply that I'm happy to take questions on and help you as much as I can, but um, the facts are the facts. And, uh, you know, it's like saying, well, you know, I want to get fit and muscle up a bit, but I haven't got time and I'm not interested in going to the gym. Well, unfortunately, those two things are, uh, go hand in hand. If you're not going to train, you don't get fitter and uh, there's no easy way around it. So it's the same sort of thing here. So if you're going to work on developing a psychosocial attachment with humans and good bonding it needs to happen early you can't catch up later be nice to think you can but uh, that's why it's called the critical period of development if it wasn't critical if it was just important we would have called it the important period but it's called the critical period in humans and dogs because you can't catch up later so it means the breeder does the work lots of social interaction and handling and social engagement pretty much every day Okay, um, so there's just some more information and more background. Um, this guy, Lindsay, who I've quoted several times here, Steve Lindsay, is an American guy, um, originally learned his craft with dogs as part of the US Superdog program um, in the military many, many years ago. The latter part of the Vietnam War, actually, is when they were doing that. And um, Lindsay's been heavily involved and... Uh, you know, he's widely regarded, or certainly was, he's probably getting a bit long in the tooth now, but um, he certainly was regarded as the world's leading expert in dog behaviour, not dog training and not animal behaviour, but specifically dog behaviour. And he wrote three amazing doc, um, books um, back in the early 2000s. This is volume one in 2000, Handbook of Applied Dog Behaviour and Training, very uh, brilliant books. But Pretty heavy reading, not something, not not light reading for a Sunday afternoon. But uh, anyway, so this is the uh, a classic example of what we're talking about, how you just can't really play catch up. Let's read it. One of the most important functions of the critical period is the formation of social attachments and bonding. In dogs, primary socialization begins around three weeks of age. Primary in this context, guys, means to the same species. So dog to dog socialization. Primary socialization is the technical term that means to the same species. 
Before three weeks, the mother is the pup's primary social object. With the onset of the socialisation period, which is around three weeks, she begins to leave the litter alone to fend for themselves for longer periods. The result is increased social bonding and attachment between litter mates and the formation of a proto-pack organisation, anticipating more adult patterns of canine behaviour. Okay, so that's important because that tells us that from three weeks, that's when the animal starts to bond with other animals, other outside of its mother. And if we wanted to bond to humans, that's the time when we really have to ramp it up, okay? So we spend a lot of time with our pups um, on the ground. You'll see some photos just hanging out, a lot of social engagement. We're doing it before. Obviously, this is well before three weeks of age. Eyes and everything's still well closed. This is only a few days old. Dutch shepherds. Um, and uh, yeah, so... And look, guys, this is well known across other things. Ray Coppinger, very famous ethologist, he's dead now, but um, you know, he 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 raised um, flock guardians or livestock guardian dogs um, and worked for the UN. They set up a program all over the world. It was probably the biggest uh, breeder of um, uh, flock guardians in the world. He's also heavily involved with uh, herding dogs, border collies, and heavily involved with um, sled dogs. So he had. A lot of experience in working dogs and stuff and again he talked everything that has to start early and he says you know with his flock guardians for example um they had to be with the sheeps around two weeks of age otherwise you're wasting your time so you just don't get a second chance at these windows and um you know, it's probably four or five main takeaways first one this early critical window, it's earlier than, than most people anticipate, even if you know a bit of the literature like Scott and Fuller, which is the most famous stuff, you sort of get the idea that you've got a much longer and much more flexible window than what you actually have, particularly if you're not breeding dogs to be particularly sociable and, and friendly animals, if you're breeding them to be racist, for example. So you've got to do one or the other. Um, and ideally both. I do want to stress that even it doesn't matter how sociable the genetics are, right? even if you're breeding specifically for human socialization, you still have to do a lot of socialization when they're young. I'm just saying you have to do a lot more if you're not breeding for that particular trait. Okay, so the point is here for cross species, meaning between dog and man, uh, and particularly to create a strong bond, it's reasonable to say that the earlier the process starts, the better. And as I said, we're starting basically from day dot and really ramping it up from about three weeks of age. So um, a question, guys, um, that uh, we should just pop a couple of quick questions back to you guys here. So uh, I'll, I'll ask the questions and then you can answer them sort of collectively. So... When a, a pup is um, being weaned off the mother, do you guys have, is there a more or less accepted protocol of how long that happens and at what age is it fair to say that, that the dog is pretty much completely weaned off the mother, not suckling anymore? So that's the first part. As an extension of that, uh, does the do the dogs then still stay with the litter mates but not the mother? And I'm not talking about if the mother comes back in, you know, now and again to see them or, you know, that, that's irrelevant. Okay, I'm just talking about whether they're still sort of dependent. So what age does that happen? Secondly, do they stay with their litter mates? And then when are they actually formally removed from their litter mates? And what happens to them when they're removed from their litter mates? So do they go out to you know, are they fostered out like a, like a police dog or a, or a border force dog would be? Those dogs are usually fostered out um, somewhere between six and 12 weeks of age, depending on the agency protocols. The US military fostered their dogs out at six weeks of age. So um, just to give you an example, US military dogs stay with the mother until about five weeks of age. They're weaned off a little bit before that. So, you know, between four and five weeks, the, the mother is sort of phased out of the equation or even earlier, probably from three and a half to about five weeks of age, the mother is progressively weaned off. Uh, by five weeks, that's it, they don't see their mother. Also, the uh, seeing eye dog people do more or less the same protocol, almost universally around the world now. Um, and then another week just with the litter mates, so between five and six weeks. Now, after six weeks, it varies a lot between agencies and organisations, but the US military, out to the foster home, six weeks of age, and they don't come back again for all intents and purposes until they're about seven months of age, and then they get assessed and they go on from there. So just like to hear a quick snapshot on what the dynamic, the, you know, the normal dynamic for you guys would be in relation to that. Kirsty, you've got somebody there who can give us an answer on that? Yeah, give me two ticks. We've just got someone coming up now. 
Okay. Right. I think with the greyhounds, it's dependent on the mother and the litter. Um, but normally around the five to six weeks is what you're saying, but we don't always take the mother and that's it. They don't ever see them. We kind of, at our property, we would let them in, uh, interact still with their pups. But with um, six to eight weeks that they go, we have to, by law, keep them until 12 weeks before we can actually sell them or give them out to other uh, trainers or other people who want to buy them. So 12 weeks. Yeah, is that that's obviously specific just to greyhounds because it's not the case with any other breed. Yeah, yep. that's it. We've got that, rules yep. of racing that yep. stipulate that. Yeah, so twelve weeks is before a greyhound can leave the property of a breeder. Wow, I, I just want to say that is completely anti-scientific. That that law, and um, if if you guys decide that you think that that's dumb and you don't like it it would be very easy to get that overturned because they would not have a leg to stand on. They would be literally, they wouldn't even fight it because yeah. they'd be so destroyed <laughs> by all the literature that it would, they, you know, any lawyer would say, we're not fighting this. We're just going to look like absolute idiots. I've got no evidence to support the argument. They've got all the evidence. It would just be a walk up start and we'll just look like a bunch of imbeciles. So even eight weeks yeah, now funny. is pretty much disdained universally. Um, okay. But, that it's way too late, you know. So, so just, like I just told you, the US military yep. have now gone to six weeks because they say that that's much better. But certainly, you know, that late is going to be completely counterproductive to long-term sociability and things like that. Almost, okay. all, I want to say, almost no matter how good the breeder is and how much work the dog does. I mean, it'll still make a big difference that the breeder is doing a lot of the right stuff, but, um, you know, you're just way, way behind the curve um, from that perspective. And I, I'm gobsmacked as to why they would have such an archaic anti-scientific law as that that doesn't make any sense at all. It's Can I just stop you there, boy? Can I just yeah. stop you there? I'm just trying to, into, uh, trying to um, stop you from a lot of things. But from the greyhound point of view, we have to, as a breeder, make sure that all of our litter is vaccinated and also microchipped, and, microchipped ear and ear branded before they leave the breeders. And also... But why is it different for a greyhound than any other breed of dog is what I want to know. It's, I don't know, sorry, but... Yeah. I'll just cut it. It's literally we've got um, a rule book. I'm not sure exactly the reason why that rule is in place, but it is nationally, um, but definitely open to bringing it up Um in terms of what we can do. Oh, the other thing probably that's just popped into my head is in terms of these dogs being ear branded and microchipped, would that be better to wait um, till they're not in a critical period just in terms of the fear that that might cause as well? What, it's probably the, better. The, 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 the ear branding, yeah, I would tend to agree with that. <clears throat> the yeah. ear branding, I, I won't comment on here, okay, because I'm not an expert on that. <clears throat> um, but the microchipping, the standard protocol for most people is that they get the microchip put in when the first vaccination happens at six weeks. So first vaccination and microchip, six weeks. And therefore, and then many working dog breeders, including the US military, um, that then they go out to their new homes. Now, um, the show dog people, they want you to wait until eight weeks. But again, it goes completely against the science. And there's a lot of criticism for that. Um, I've got all the research on this and all the studies. So it's beyond the scope of today. We don't want to get bogged down on that. But going forward, if you do want the information, I have loads of it. I have a whole presentation on homing age, okay? Um, and so, you know, anything that you want as far as a resource and we can talk about it going forward. But um, I, I just want, the reason I'm so shocked about it, guys, is that that is going to be part of the problem. So, you, you know, it's like two steps forward, one step back sort of thing. So even if the breeder did do all the things that I'm recommending, this late homing age itself is going to be, you know, counterproductive to what we really want to achieve and um, is completely nonsensical and completely against the science of it. And, um, you know, if you were telling the Europeans that, they'd be absolutely horrified. They'd be going, oh, my God, we think eight weeks is ridiculous and you're doing it at 12 weeks, you know. Professional breeders would say that, you know, of working dogs, you know, for like police dogs, detector dogs and stuff like that, um, they would say that eight weeks is silly. You know, you've really missed a lot of opportunities and you, it's well suboptimal, okay? So professional breeders around the world of working dogs and, and the like 
would normally be saying six or seven weeks, you know, is the time to go. And that all the research suggests that as well. And there's some, been some really good studies about that um, because fear and uh, fear, anxieties and aggression are all increased for dogs leaving later than say seven weeks of age. And it goes up from there. Okay. And there's some very clear scientific reasons why that happens that I won't get into today, but um, you know, that the, it's, it's hard science why that happens. It's not just about opinion. We know why, why we know exactly the reasons why we know the mechanisms it's not just opinion all right let's go i was yep. just going to say also with us we would have our pups together until about four months and then we would start to um isolate them and just put them into like separate kennels and things like that yep. or different schooling yards yeah to put it to put to put it in perspective we start that no later than six weeks no later than six weeks, okay? Uh, not completely. We start it, okay? We call it separation protocols. Um, Kirsty, I, I have an, a, 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 um, a, a sort of a, a snapshot document, a couple of pages long. So if you just make a note, it's, co it's called separation protocols. Um, I'll get that to you if you want to distribute it out to your people. Just uh, It's not our whole manual on the subject, which goes right into the prescription, you know, for the people who are doing so a young pup and young dog program with us, but that's quite in depth. Okay. This is just a nice couple of pages long, might be three pages. I can't remember two or three pages. So, you know, 10, 15 minute read. And it just talks about how we separate our pups. Now I'm not saying that you have to follow our protocols, but at least it gives you an overview. Okay. All right. Um, okay. I want to jump forward. That's, Scott, guys, for those that know Scott and Fuller, okay, that is John Paul Scott, the man himself, okay. Um, so we've known all this stuff for a long period of time about this early stuff, and now I want to get into with the um, this bit a bit more specifics, okay. So the original research didn't identify how the protocols impacted on the dog's abilities or performance in working and service dogs, okay. So Really, all those early researchers, for those that are familiar with the critical periods, whether you want to call it three to 12 weeks, four to 16 weeks, depends on which paper you're reading and stuff, but it's all around that same dynamic. They weren't really measuring dogs for performance for any particular task. It was just whether they were normally socialized and had normal relationships, okay? Um, what we now realize is that 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 is a suboptimal sort of thing and it is genetically relevant. So if you've got dogs that are genetically predisposed to be a bit sensitive and reactive um, as you know, quite a number of working type breeds can be, um, then you have to make things happen a bit earlier and do that extra work to sort of compensate, okay? I want to stress that most of the things that I'm suggesting you would do with the pup in this early page are actually pretty much fun. It's just hanging out with your pups, socialising them, handling them, getting people to come over and socialise with them, having environments for them to explore and investigate, and uh, just basically not living a, a you know, a, an uh, impoverished life, you know, isolated, not much happening, no change, not much stimulation, not meeting people and things like that, okay? So we want a very enriched life, okay, for environment and for people and interactions, okay? And we need it early, really early, starting, you know, three or four weeks of age. Okay, I go back to Dunbar, veterinary behaviourist Dunbar, 100 people before eight weeks of age and another 100 by 16 weeks of age to immunise dogs against fear. Now, I'm not saying that everybody needs to do that. Even we don't achieve that. We'd be lucky if we achieve half that, to be honest. You know, well, I'd be happy with 35 or 40 um, people before uh, seven weeks because seven weeks to me is the right time to rehome. Uh, and then when the dog goes home to its new family, we say, now invite your friends over and especially if they've got kids, want to try and have visitors over every day so the pup just keeps meeting and greeting people all the time and I understand that if you're keeping your pups until 12 weeks of age that's got to be nigh impossible to achieve for most breeders um, and in fact some of you might even be nervous about doing it because you're thinking about health issues and stuff like that and again historically going back decades that was a concern and that was real but we've moved beyond that now so we can't be relying on 70 year old or 50 year old technology and, and uh, attitudes we have to evolve so okay so um yeah there's we just want to be able to get good stuff going okay um again a study 
uh, on the difference in the emotional development of pups. In other words, how they're going to cope later on and whether they're going to be emotionally sound or whether they're going to be reactive and hypersensitive and the effects of early gentle uh, gentling, which is handling, okay? It's just the term they use here. It literally means handling, okay? Um, and so, yeah, a lot of... Um, benefit from this early stuff and again i'm stressing i mean early early so even before the eyes are open but certainly no later than about three weeks of age lots of handling and lots of picking up and stuff like that so okay so um any questions at this stage guys i'm going to move on to something else now okay this is shane by the way he's with us here tonight um, so early neurological stimulation, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Um, many of you may already know about it. So I'm really just doing it as a, a as a sort of a reminder, if you will, and, and for those that don't know. So during the um, in, it, during back in the 1960s and 70s, the Americans, American military did a lot of research about how they could develop pups, what could they do with early pups to help uh, develop them. And they developed these procedures called early neurological stimulation, uh, where they would do things like tickle between the toes with cotton buds, orientation exercises, temperature, that's a cold mat being in the freezer, um, and surfaces and things like that. Back in the day, they actually put the dogs in centrifuges and in the fridge and things like that. You can read about that in Lindsay's book, volume one, a little bit. Um, it's not talked about too much. I actually have all the original research. I got it from the guys that were in the Superdog program back in the day. It's all typed you know, because they were using typewriters back then. But um, yeah, I got copies of it all. So um, yeah, it was pretty full on. And that, that really made a big difference, this early neurological stimulation. So it got the, it sort of, for want of a better way of putting it, it kickstarted the uh, nervous system and really gave the dogs a really good head start. Um, there's a pretty good video um, online um, on this website breeding better dogs okay that's the website um it's run by a guy named carmen particular this this is his uh name surname here if you want the spelling of it okay and uh but just breeding better dogs website and they have like a 10 minute video that shows you how to do it so i won't spend too much time on it it's really about just developing good stress that gets the uh the productive elements of the nervous system going um that in a way, the way to think about it, it's almost like compensating for what would have happened in the wild. Because we rear our pups in such idyllic situations, you know, air-conditioned and heated environments and, you know, very insulated and very protected, that, that actually retards nervous system development, okay? They, they need those environmental stimuli to actually kickstart the nervous system. And when we protect them from it, the nervous system uh, either doesn't develop properly or delays in learning. It starts too late. So the idea idea of early neurological stimulation is to mimic that um, and uh, do it at least once a day but I think twice a day is better it doesn't take very long you know you can do the whole thing with about five minutes a pup and uh, you can even you know sometimes you might have interns in or people that are helping out young kids you know school kids and stuff they can do it it's not very technical you know you can teach somebody how to do it in about 10 minutes and as I said there's nice videos available online particularly at this website that literally take you through it step by step exactly what to do so a cheap easy thing for producing better dogs and more resilient dogs okay so more stress resilient so they're we know that they're physiologically more resilient as well as psychologically more resilient who doesn't want that so a dog that is uh, you know recovers from injury quicker a dog that uh, is less uh, has a stronger immune system uh stronger heart you know um and bigger brains okay because they um everything gets kick-started a little bit earlier Pretty easy to use, pretty easy to do. Um, won't get too much into it. Recommended by the American Kennel Club as well. They, uh, this is from them. When performed correctly, early neurological stimulation believed to impact the neurological system by kicking into action earlier than would normally be expected. As a result, being increased capacity that later will help to make a difference in its performance. Benefits have been observed in dogs that were exposed to ENS, including improved cardiovascular performance. That's got to be good for you guys. Okay. Stronger heartbeat. That's good for you guys. Stronger adrenal glands, more tolerance to stress and greater resistance to disease, as well as a whole lot of other stuff. Okay. Here are some references from you for you as well. Okay. As well as particularly as website there, which I just gave you breeding better dogs. But um, so this is, you can just look at this online on the website of the American Kennel Club. 
puppy socialization. They've got a bit of stuff there and uh, a good place from, from a guy who ran it, okay, Michael Fox, he's a vet, and he was the head vet for the US military super, uh, super dog program and he developed the protocols and stuff like that. And you can read about it at a basic level in his book, Understanding Your Dog, okay? Still available, get the second edition, okay? And uh, he talks about what they were doing. That's a cut out of his book and stuff like that. And uh, they got significant improvements. Cheap, easy way to get uh, improved performance right across the board. In theory, they should even be better races, okay? Um, but certainly they'll be better dogs. Okay, um, handling and social in interaction. I think I talked about that enough, guys. Here's just some more references um, if for those that you know, want. I never know who's in the audience, guys. You've got some people who don't care about books and studies and things like that. They just want the facts. And you've got other people who love the science and want the details. I'm trying to, uh, uh, to cater for everybody as much as I can. I'm not reading it all. You can capture it. You've got a video. You can take pictures with your phone or whatever and uh, just some good references for you, okay? So um, the main point of this one here, guys, is that reiterating the point here that, uh, here that it says gains experience by interacting and requires to be exposed to a human environment, okay? So they need to get out and see things. Now, again, I'm not exactly sure what your regulations limit you to do as far as, say, early excursions. And I mean early by comparison to what you're talking about. I'm not talking about 12 weeks of age. I'm talking about way before 12 weeks. These pups are six weeks old, okay? Um, and uh, they're going out and about, okay? And um, there's a nice, I don't think I've got it listed here, but there's a nice video presentation by a um, American scientist and breeder. Her name is Patricia Princehouse, Patricia Princehouse. And the video is called The Poor Prince of History. And you can look it up on uh, YouTube. Poor Prince of History, Patricia Princehouse. And she talks about the fact that she takes her pups out for excursions like this at five weeks of age, okay? Now, we don't do it at five weeks because we want to get that first vaccination out of the way. But as soon as that first vaccination out is, we're out and about, we're out in the real world, okay? And we'll even go earlier than that to places where we know where there's really good controls, okay? So to other people's places where we know. So going over to friends' houses or going over to other environments where you feel they're very safe from the environmental uh, elements, okay? Okay, so um, I don't know what Parvo's like over there, guys, and I know we've got people potentially from around Australia here at the moment. I know it varies from state to state, so I don't want to make generalised statements, but certainly Parvo is a hell of a lot rarer than um, than what it used to be. And um, the feedback we get from the bre from the breeders here in Victoria is that uh, they hardly ever even see it, most of them, and uh, many of them haven't seen it for years So uh, in a pup. So that tells you how rare it is. Whereas the fear and stress problem, dogs are getting euthanized left, right and center for. And I, I just want to stress, guys, that following the protocols I'm talking about is effectively inoculation of stress and reactivity. So if a dog, I don't really care what the genetics are, can be a nervous dog genetically, if you super socialize and environmentally expose that dog in the right time, when they're very young, not 12 weeks, that's way too late, way too late. You're not even in the right ballpark, okay? Um, you, you know, these pups are a few days old and they're already meeting and being handled by people, okay? And by, you know, by the time they hit three to four weeks, it's full on, okay? Lots of socialization. We were doing a... Um, a consult out at uh, Border Force uh, a few weeks back and uh, they were doing stuff with their six-week-old puppy and uh, I said to them, okay, so I like everything you're doing. It's all good, okay? Now, these pups are six weeks old. Everything is really good. I would say, we just do one thing differently. And they said, what's that? And I said, we're doing what you're doing at six weeks. We're doing that at four weeks of age. And they go, really? And I go, yeah, four weeks. By the time our pups are six weeks, they're already pretty bomb-proof. They are immune to noises, meeting lots of people. You know, they're, they're very worldly. They're not at all spooked. They are out and about and seeing it. Now, if you can't take them off the property, then you create the environment, you know, for them as much as you possibly can and get people in to meet them. So that's comes back to that point for most of you. I'm sure I'm saying, you're saying, wow, this is way more, way earlier than what I realised or what I expected. Well, that's why I'm here to try and enlighten you as to what, we, what we've what we learned in the last 20 years. And this pretty much 
immunizes the dogs against all of those problems later on, okay? So you can actually fix the problem, more or less, regardless of the genetics. Genetics matter when you're talking about a, a police dog or a racing dog or a sled dog or a herding dog, no doubt. For the skill development that you need, good racer, good sledder, whatever, that's for sure the genetics. But if you're talking about nervousness and reactivity and anxiety in the real world, that's much more about the early environment, okay? We used to think it was a lot about the genetics. We used to think, oh, you know, this dog's got the fear gene or whatever. Um, turns out we just underestimated the importance of these early periods. We were just doing too little too late, particularly too late. Okay, so plenty. Uh, we talked about the handling there before. Again, even the American Kennel Club are on board with this now, okay? So advocating the handling at least two times a day, every day, pretty much from the beginning. Uh, not starting at three or four or five weeks of age, that's just way, way too late, okay? This is typical of the type of social engagement that we'd be doing with the pups when they're very, very young and continuing. This is that quote from Ian Dunbar, okay? So 100 people before they're eight weeks of age and another 100 before 16 weeks. Again. I think we can all agree for most of us, that's unattainable. Take it for what it was meant. Understand the principle. 100 is probably just an arbitrary number. What he's saying is that five people before eight weeks of age is nowhere near enough, particularly if you don't have the genetics to back it up, okay? If you're not breeding for social sociability in your dogs. And I mean breeding for sociability as your priority. You don't care if the dog runs. You don't care how pretty it is. You just care that it's social. Well, then you might get a little bit of flexibility in the dynamic and you can probably get away with 10 people before eight weeks of age. But for everybody else, which is me included and all of you guys, since we're not selecting for that super sociability, we're breeding for traits that we like. You want fast dogs. I want high drive dogs. Okay. In that case, uh, we've got to compensate. So we say got to be at least 30 to 40 people before seven weeks of age, because seven weeks for us is the, is the best time to rehome. So when they get rehomed, of course, now they're meeting a whole lot of new people as well on top of the people that they've met in our environment. Okay. And this is just classic examples, again, of just all this handling and social interaction, yeah? Okay. Um, kids as well. So um, usually not that hard to get kids from schools and stuff to volunteer. As you can see, the kids in their school clothes. So we uh, encourage them to come in. Everybody we know, we, um, we try and encourage them to come and socialise with the pups. Okay, uh, yeah, I'm going to move on from this, guys, now, okay. So just here with our pups, four weeks old, and part of what we like to do is have them in a social group. So this is sort of like uh, mixing with the pack. We've got some food here, so like the pack has brought home dinner for the pups and they're having social engagement, close interactive social engagement with other members of the pack, which is a great bonding and imprinting process. And you definitely want diversity of people. So uh, V here has uh, never seen the pups today. This is the first time she's actually interacted with them. Whereas the guys over here have been interacting with them on an almost daily basis since they were born. And just let them hang out, just be part of the pack, part of letting them explore. We're also in a separate area here. We're well away from the nest. Mum is over here, just hanging out, doing her own thing. But uh, she's she wasn't here five minutes ago. She was off exploring and just all part of the making the situation as natural and as beneficial as we can and progressively weaning the dog off mum and moving away from the nest. So that would be a typical exercise that we would do on a daily basis. And again, trying to introduce new and different people, including kids and stuff, on a, <clears throat> as often as possible. Okay, I just want to say that it is kind of dose, to spend, dose dependent. So the more new people you can get and the more regularly you can do it, the better it'll be. So even if the numbers I'm giving you, like 100 people on this, and you know, even if they're not attainable, any increase will be very beneficial, okay? Very beneficial. So even if you get the gist of what I'm saying and you can't follow the prescription, I have to say that I'm usually bought on, bought on as a consultant for optimal, okay? So like with Border Force, 
since we're talking about them. Obviously, they've got a massive program. Okay, that's the biggest breeding program of any agency in the, in Australia. They do about 24 litters a year at an average of 7.5 pups per litter. <clears throat> you can do the numbers there. Um, they don't use all those dogs. They sell a lot of them off and, and that to other agencies and organisations. But it is a big organisation and uh, it's a massive complex. And so they've got a pretty good result and they've brought us on as consultants to get to move from good to great, so to speak, to optimise the process. Boy, so, boy uh, can I just ask a question? Of course. Through, through all your... Um... Uh, handling and uh, the ability to have so many people. How did you go through your COVID years? Uh, of handling and having many people on the property and taking them out and things like that. Uh, in Victoria, where effectively you can call us an essential service, so to suppose. So pet care, like if you were looking after pets and animals, you were pretty much exempt from the regulations of having people coming. So we simply were able to work through it without a problem. And um, we remember that we're happy to take the pups off the property. Okay, we're, we're not afraid of that at all, as long as we're going to safe locations, you know. By a safe location, I mean, you know, people ask me, what do you mean? Okay, well, here are some examples. Go to a friend's place. Um, if they've got a dog, okay, if it's not a safe dog, don't go there or keep the dog out in the backyard. Or families that have kids that don't have a dog. That's a safe place, you know, uh, and that's a great excursion and great environmental enrichment and exposure. So I guess the short answer is you have to be creative because I, I preface that in my introduction where I say, um, you know, on the, on the very early slide, I don't want to go right back to the beginning, but one of the very first slides I put up, stop making excuses and socialise the hell out of your dog, okay? That's the answer, okay? So stop making covid is just an excuse to me, okay? I live out rural, it's just an excuse. Oh, somebody told me, it's just an excuse, okay? They're all just excuses, okay? Just like people who don't exercise, you know, unless they're physically disabled or something, you know? I mean, we all know we can all exercise if we really put our mind to it. We can make excuses and say, I'm too busy or I'm this or I'm that. But at the end of the day, we know really, if we're honest with ourselves, it's kind of just making excuses for the most part. So where there's a will, there's a way, find a way, get people, recruit people and um, be proactive. Work amongst yourselves, you know, like, I mean, you've got a whole community of the greyhounds, you know, develop a system. The police, for example, they have relationships with several schools. So they, with every puppy litter, they know that the schools are happy for the um, pups to come along and they just take the whole herd. They load them all up in a vehicle go off to an excursion to pre-arranged schools where they regularly have regular relationships with. I'm sure you guys could do the same thing. They also have a relationship with the local uh, college for their Cert 4 in Companion Animal Services, I think it's called, the pet dog pe people who work in pet shops, looking after guinea pigs and stuff like that. As part of their Cert 4, they um, do take the pups out on social uh, the police dog pups, they go on excursions with them um, and come and do act training activities with them and, and environmental exposure and these types of things with them, yeah? So I guess my advice would be think about it. If it means something to you, find a way around it. Um, I've just given you some things. Build relationships with people and um, think about where you could go. I don't want to spend too much time just on that one point, but if that is a point, Kirsty, if that is a point that you want more, then I could flick you over some more suggestions and stuff and even videos of things, okay? I'm mindful of not showing too many videos because they do suck time. But if you notice here, guys, a lot of these things are actually videos. They're not just photos. I'm just not showing them because we're a bit pushed for time. Sorry, Boyd. Are we able to have that 15-minute break now? Just hit 7.30 for us? Absolutely. Yep. All no right. Worries. No okay. worries. See you in 15 minutes, guys. I'll keep it live and open. Okay, guys, welcome back to part two. Uh, getting a little bit in the weeds now, just to give you a little bit of the sort of uh, the biology and physiology behind why this early stuff matters for those that uh, care. But again, many of the slides will only be for your information since it's being recorded and you can take photos just so as you can look up uh, further. Okay, so what, what is it about these critical periods? Well, basically, they start shortly after the relevant sensory information uh, first becomes available. And since we're mainly concerned about things the dog sees and hears, we care about when those sensory capacities come online. 
So just as a rough approximation, this is about how it works in dogs. It does vary a little bit between breeds. We don't have to be pedantic in which, you know, how exactly precisely accurate this is. It's the gist we care about. So uh, we all know that dogs can't see and hear. Uh, when they're young and they start to come online and get better and better over those times. The uh, period that I'm most concerned about is when this, um, when the um, sensory capacities and locomotion are really coming online and the brain is somewhat overloaded during this time, obviously trying to get vision, audition and locomotion online, there's a lot going on. So it doesn't do much else. And in fact, the fear system isn't switched on during this time. In other words, they're effectively immune from fear during this time. It has a formal name, I'll reference it. You can look up the research, which I've got there for you, in case you think I'm telling you stories. Okay, so... Um, so based on that, since we now know that the critical period is going to come once the sensory capacities come online, then for most breeds, sort of between about four and eight weeks of age, some breeds like shepherd breeds that we're mainly interested in, like Belgian Malinois and Dutch shepherds, German shepherds, probably a bit earlier than this, more like about three and a half weeks of age. Um, and for some other breeds, maybe retriever breeds, probably got a little bit of gap the other way, okay? Uh, it certainly still starts early, but it probably stretches out a little bit at the back end. So it finishes a bit earlier for some breeds and a bit later for others but on average across the spectrum it's it's roughly this age okay so this is when all the heavy lifting needs to be done and that's why i said before it really comes back to um the breeder doing pretty much all of the heavy lifting so if you think about what we said before and i'll get into this in a little bit more detail but if you think we, before we said the breeder's going to do a lot of the socialization and then the pup would go to its new home let's say for the sake of this discussion around seven weeks of age at that stage, the breeder could have done a lot with their environmental enrichment and uh, exposure, conditioning, socialisation and everything. And then when they go to their new home, that's when it all starts again, because there's all sorts of new things there and, and the dog is continuing its journey. Now, two things that are important. This, this uh, orange light shaded category area here is this period of super plasticity um, when the brain can really learn really easily and that's fundamentally what we why we call it the critical period that's when the brain is really plastic and learns super super well okay at the same time a totally different system the fear system is actually coming online progressively so effectively it's not online until four weeks of age i'll clarify that in a few minutes i've got plenty of data on that um, and then it progressively comes online and hits a peak around eight weeks and usually stays up at that peak for a few weeks. You know, again, varies from individual to individual and breed, but, you know, maybe around 10, maybe even as long as 12 weeks of age, it, it stays at a fairly high and then it starts to dwindle down again. Okay. So, um, and that, that means fear learning. So the fear system reaches its optimal point. So it's going to learn to be fearful of things the most when it's about eight weeks of age. Now, for those that are insulated from the rest of the world, because you're locked into the greyhound guys, um, the majority of show dog breeders home their dogs at around eight weeks of age, which by any account, by any measure, and by any scientific idea is crazy to be blunt okay because two things happen one their socialization goes down dramatically at eight weeks and two their fear hits a peak so if you could pick a worst if you said to me what is the single worst exact age to rehome a pup i would say eight weeks of age okay and yet that's what the show dog community are advocating and they wonder why they've got so many problems the working dog community are saying to these people what are you doing Okay, I already told you that the US military, and that's a big organization, guys, as you well know, and uh, run th th that department is run by Stuart Hilliard, who was a mentor of mine, um, a very, very smart guy. Not only is he a dog guy, but, you know, he's got a degree in psychology and a, and a PhD in behavioral neuroscience. <laughs> and um, and so he is a really, really smart guy. And uh, yeah, he says, no, no, the pups need to get out in the real world at eight, at six weeks of age. That's when they send them out to their fosters. And you don't think that they would keep them until eight or 12 weeks if they thought that was optimal. So this homing age really does make a difference. And remember, this is Michael Fox, the guy who ran the system for the US Superdog program back in the day. And this is when they need to be socialized. So if their socialization drops away, why would they go to their new home and start meeting new people after the optimum window.
we're keeping them away from the people they need to socialise with until after the optimal window closes. We're saying, no, no, the time when you would be best suited to become friendly with people will keep you isolated. Then once that closes and it's going to be more difficult for you to be social, then we will let you go out into the real world. I mean, it is literally as dumb as it sounds. I wish it wasn't. I wish there was some sort of hidden thing there. You know, what's the catch? There is none. It's just dumb. Okay, so um, this is a online video that I recommend you watch. You can watch it on uh, YouTube, guys. Okay, this is Catherine Lord. She's a researcher in these areas. Um, I've got another slide that gives you the full detail, so we'll come to it in a minute. So, but here's the key point. They're very plastic at that point, and you can raise them in a lot of different situations. But once you have the brain developed and you try to change it, that's when you get really serious issues. It's when the sensory capacities become fully operational. It's when the brain is most plastic. It's when the foundation learning um, about stimuli in the environment, and this includes social stimuli. So really, this is our window. It's all in the hands of the breeder. Okay. Yeah. All right, um, again, more information on the social imprinting since you guys are you know, primarily concerned about the dogs being good with people. I mean, I, I, my understanding is that both the environment and people are important, but pre people is going to be our top level. We can end up with a dog that's sociable with people. So if it goes doesn't make it in the game um, and it goes out, it's going to be good with people. It's not going to be fearful and timid and reactive towards humans and stuff like that. So again, we want to do plenty of stuff um, during this early period of time. So this again is from Catherine Lord. She's a top researcher in this area. She did her studies with Ray Coppinger, who is an absolute legend. I can't, he's not a living legend because he died in 2017, but he is a legend. I used to call him the greatest living ethologist. Um, I did some stuff with Ray several times. He was in Australia back years ago. And um, I went over to the States and did some stuff with him about a decade ago. And so uh, this is from Catherine, who did the extensive research. She's the one that did the research with the guide dogs, German Shepherds, uh, Labradors, Golden Retrievers, and uh, identifying these updating these early periods. So this is what she found. At four weeks of age, they're not frightened of anything. And that's consistent with this fear curve here, okay? They walk right up to a Godzilla. They don't care. They walk right up to it. At five weeks, they get a little bit more frightened. Six weeks, a bit more. Seven, a bit more. And by eight weeks, they actually will not approach something that is truly and completely novel, okay? So uh, the fear grows. That tells us early is the window, the most plasticity and the least fear when they're younger. So intuitively, this is why we get it wrong. Intuitively, we think as they mature, they'll get more confident. So the later we leave it, the more confident they are, and therefore the more easy they will be to socialize and to environmentally exposed. We got it completely back to front. Okay, it's exactly the opposite. The fear grows early. We need to get in and do the early work. Okay, and that's why Patricia Princehouse says, Why would I wait to go on excursions until six or seven or eight weeks of age when they're more prepared and more plastic? They're going to get way more benefit with way less stress if I start early. Okay, we live on not live, but our facility is on a big property. And so therefore we have it all set up for environment. In fact, this is part of our puppy rearing area. This is where the pups live. And as you can see, they're just hanging out. This dog's asleep on a mesh grid, okay? Just gone to sleep. So by the time these pups are six, seven weeks of age, they're so environmentally exposed that they're not spooked by anything because they're literally living in complex environments and getting lots of exposure and, and the like. Okay, so plenty of stuff that we can do. And um, and again, if you need more information, this is from Lindsay. Um, I'll quickly read this. The critical sensitive period hypothesis stresses that a short period of time, a window of opportunity exists during for optimal socialization can be fully realized. A reasonable objection against delaying secondary. Remember, secondary socialization is to another species like humans. Primary is to other dogs until around seven weeks are based on arguments favoring early starting point for socialization. Five week old pups are more outgoing and less fearful of social contact than our seven weeks. Again, that sounds counterintuitive. The five week old pups are more outgoing and less fearful than seven week old pups. I'm gonna go back a slide, okay? Look at this, five weeks, they get a little bit more, six a bit more, seven a bit more, consistent. Same with the curve. Five weeks, they are less fearful than at seven weeks. Everybody's singing. That look at the timing. Okay. This is from 2021. Okay. This is from 2000. Okay. Lindsay, 2000. So 20 years ago, we were still saying the same thing. Okay. And it goes back even beyond that. 
So it would appear to make sense, therefore, to initiate socialisation with humans at an earlier stage in the socialisation process rather than waiting. Certainly, it's a period when conscientious breeders should be providing daily and carefully handling and exposure consistent with a pup's future placement. And exposure consistent with future pups, with pup's future placement, okay? So that means kids that means noises it means whatever it is the environment you know some machinery some noises some different surfaces from real world some crowds if you can plenty of bang and crash okay and we want it to start early why because the brain is plastic then because the fear is low then it increases as time goes on completely counterintuitive people you would everybody would think the fear would surely they would get more confident with that where when they age turns out that's not the case Okay, so um, while caregivers are often blamed for their dog's behavioural issues, the dogs may be victims of poor breeding practices, environments that fail to prepare them for life as pets in a home. Breeders may influence environmental factors which have a great impact on the dog's future. Puppies go through stages of development and breeders should be equipped with the knowledge to maximise positive behavioural outcomes during these stages. Again, from the veterinary nurse, okay, volume one. Okay, this is what it's called. Again, you can see that online. Can I just say, guys, my point, everybody who is looking at the science, everybody who is looking at it deeply is saying the same thing, okay? I understand that, you know, there are people out there who are not saying this, but they are not basing it on science. They are not basing it on the evidence. They are, I'm going to be blunt, making shit up, okay? They're just, there is no credibility to what they are saying, okay? That's Ray Coppinger, the guy that I was talking about before. Okay, so making sure that we're getting out doing everything. Everybody is telling the same story. Okay, exposure to benign novelty during the period is sense to be essential to early development of a sound temperament. Okay, and optimal welfare. Okay, when are they saying what's that period they're talking about? Starting from 2.5 to three weeks to sometime between 12. It doesn't mean that you cannot do it 2.5 to three weeks and start at eight or 10 weeks. And what this tells you, relevant to you, the reason we were so gobsmacked, I was talking to my team uh, during the break there, guys, and they were saying, oh my God, is that we know that 12 weeks is the real cutoff. So if your dogs are not getting out in the real world until 12 weeks of age, it's no wonder they have trouble adapting. That one thing is going to be so difficult to overcome because it is completely ascientific and it goes directly against exactly everything we've learned in the last 70 years. Okay. I do not know one piece of information, one thing that it could possibly support that. There was one study out of the South African police um, uh, in, I think, 1993, so 30 years ago saying that they found some benefits in keeping the pups until 12 weeks of age. It's been so smashed to bits and debunked, and even they withdrew it. By the end of the 1990s, they uh, retracted it. It's the only study I've ever read that advocates 12-week um, homing age. Um, and it's been and it's 30 years old, and it's been completely debunked, even by their own people, okay? So definitely not the way to go. Okay, and again, look at the study here, guys. Sensitive periods in the development of behavioural organisation in the dog. Okay, this is this is a very good crew here. At Appleby and Bradshaw, two very, very prolific um, scientists out of the UK. And uh, this is really top tier science that we're talking about. Okay, environmental conditioning. Um, this is the kind of thing that we do with our dogs, guys, um, when they're young, going out places, doing things. Um, this is again from that same crew, guys, Appleby and Bradshaw, okay? Restricted experience known to contribute to long-lasting predispositions to fear and anxiety. Look at the key word here, guys, restricted experience. That means keeping the dog at your place, okay? That's what this means, okay? Let's be blunt. Restricted experience, keeping your dog at your place and not doing much, okay? In early life is known to contribute to long-lasting predispositions to fear and anxiety in mammals, okay? There we go. It's right there for you. It's commonplace for young domestic dogs not to experience many features of the environment in which they will spend their adult lives until after eight weeks of age. It sounds to me like in your case, it could be as late as 12 weeks. I don't know what you're doing with the breeders, whether you are able to go out on excursions, whether you're having people at home. I hope you are. But even then, it's going to be fairly limited by this 12-week regulation that you have. Okay, simulations of that environment presented. I won't go into the detail, guys. This is about um, audio-visual simulations to mimic it, 
okay? If you are interested in it, review this study, okay? You can get it on Google Scholar, okay? Journal of Behaviour Science, paraphrase from this study from 2010. I'll go back a slide, okay, or two. That's the study, okay? So if you put that into Google Scholar and you want to read it, um, this is the one, okay? So you, nice and easy to find. Just plug those keywords into Google Scholar. If you don't know how to find Google Scholar, Google it. Just put Scholar into Google. It'll come up as a separate search engine. And then you just plug those keywords into Google Scholar and the study will come up. Find the PDF and you're off to the races. Okay, this is a top study, by the way. Really good people, really good science and a really good journal. Okay, so they ticked all the boxes. Very good study. And guess what? They found exactly the same thing over and over and over again. Okay. This would be a typical type of thing. I'll just show a quick video of the type of thing that we might do with our young pups. So we've got our nine week old puppy today. It's in fact right on. So have a look at how environmentally sound he is at this age. He already doesn't care about any sort of surfaces or environments or any of these types of things. Pretty much bomb proof. You can take this dog out to a shopping centre. Uh, you can take it to a school, whatever. You can take it on any surfaces. He couldn't care less. Notice that he really just, the surface just doesn't even make any difference to him. It doesn't matter. Grass, grapes, grills. And I want to stress, you might say, oh, well, we don't really care about surfaces. It's the principle, guys, okay? It's about environmental stimuli. It's about exposure. It's about neutrality, okay? The dog just doesn't care about things, okay? He's just, just another day at the office, couldn't care less. About going places, doing things. So we're going to spin around and go up here. By the way, guys, I know you guys are not many of you in Victoria, but um, if you're ever down our way, please look us up. Come out for a visit. We're training dogs all the time. We have guests all the time from all sorts of agencies and organisations and stuff like that. So you're always welcome to come out for a visit. Just let us know in advance. That's me, by the way, for those who don't know me. Okay, uh, again, just more socialization sort of stuff with the people lying around on the ground and socializing and stuff like that. I won't bother uh, boring you with the whole uh, video again because you get the drift of getting out and being socially exposed. Before your puppy is 12 oh, weeks nice. old, he or she should be socializing. Okay, so a little bit of the science. I won't get into it. It's there for you. I'm gonna give you four or five references because again, some people find it hard to believe. So if I give you all the data, you can do your own research. At least you know I'm just, you know, Boyd, you can't say Boyd's telling stories. You can say, hey, he referenced everything he claimed, okay? And I uh, make it my business to do that. Okay, so in dogs, there's a period in the early weeks of life when effectively the fear system has not been turned on in the brain. Uh, in a now famous research by Sapolsky and Meany in 1986, and yes, for those that do know Robert Sapolsky, that is him, same man, referred to this as the stress non-response period back then. This short early period occurs as the sensory capacities are coming online from around three weeks of age, and this is now referred to as the stress hypo-response period. They just changed it later on, okay, once it became more established. This is effectively a period when the brain is insensitive to stress and fear learning. Now, that sounds amazing. You're saying what you're saying, the dog can't learn fear, that is exactly what I am saying, guys. How freaky is that? Okay, so this color code here, guys, tells you the stress hypo-response While these sensory capacities are coming online, the fear system isn't engaged. It's not online. So you can do lots of socialization and environmental exposure and enrichment way earlier than you think, okay? That's when the fear, look at the fear. The fear is down here at zero, okay? But can I stress, Lord is saying it. Fox is saying it. Lindsay is saying it. These are some of the world's most respected um, and experienced people. This is not just one thing out of the box. Everybody is telling the same story. If you'd like to watch a video that talks a little bit about it, Jess Heckman um, talks about it in the, uh, the stress hypo response period in a video presentation at the Sparks conference, which is the same conference that um, the Catherine Lord one that I mentioned, their videos online. This is from 2018. Catherine's was from 2013. Um, so if you care about this, the whole presentation is not about this specific point, but Jess discusses it during that time, okay? Uh, if you want more, if you want to get into the weeds, the best general reference, it's technical, uh, is from the um, from Schmidt from the Handbook of Stress Series, Volume 3, okay, which is a technical manual for psychiatrists and psychologists dealing with stress and stuff like that. But again, 
talks about this stress resilience and vulnerability stress disorders later in life. Critical development period is the so-called stress hypo response period, which has been defined by the reduced uh, cortical release, okay, stress hormone releases during that time. And that's, that's again, a quote from that book if you uh, really want to get into the weeds and learn more about it, okay? That's a technical manual, okay? So I do warn you that it's, it's heavy reading. Okay, so... Uh, when pups are between three and four weeks of age, exploratory behavior increases dramatically. Pups will also readily approach and investigate all novel stimuli without showing any fear. Look at that. All will investigate all novel stimuli without showing any fear. This is Linda Case, veterinary behaviorist, okay, from her very big book, okay. After about five weeks, it's written in my references at the end, by the way, guys, so if you want to capture those references, I've got a few pages of them, it's there. After about five weeks, uh, the response diminishes gradually as the puppy begins to show increasing wariness, exactly like Lord said, exactly like Lindsay, okay. At four weeks, they're bomb-proof. They're not afraid of anything, three to four weeks. At five weeks, it response diminishes gradually as the pup begins to show increasing wariness wariness exactly the same thing five weeks a bit more six weeks a bit more seven weeks a bit more and from the original research where they actually discovered it okay this tells you the technical reason why it basically the corticoid which is just your you know your your um stress hormone okay it doesn't adjust during that time it just stays in a low stable level okay irrespective of what you're exposed to because that system just hasn't come online yet Okay, and this is the name of that original study if you're into technical stuff. Okay, okay, so I think I've given you sufficient evidence to understand now that why this early period, including the physiology and a bit of science behind it without going too deep. Okay, so really we're talking about our three to seven week period, our early environmental exposure, um, maybe create environments for your pups where they're being raised. This is where the puppies are living. Okay, this is not, they haven't gone out on an excursion to do this. These, and we're creating little challenges where they have to climb over and under things to get their food. See this puppy trying to get up to his food. This is a drum. It's not supported. So it rocks and rolls and it's got a grid and the pups have to make their way in. You do this progressively, but this is where they live. You understand? I'm not just pulling them out for a 10 minute excursion. This is where they're growing up. So they're fundamentally just self-socializing and self-environmental. And we do take them out places, of course, but this is inside our puppy area, our compound where the pups are raised. And you can see all the different challenges and environments and variations that we're putting, okay? Um, I have lots of videos on it, guys, but because we're pushed for time, I just want to get it. Be creative is what I'm saying, okay? It's not that hard to create an enriched environment for your pup, which everything will help. People coming along, lots of different surfaces, challenges, okay? You should see the video of this one here with these pups trying to get up. This one doesn't make it and he gives up. Then this one comes along and he can't get up there. And then this one comes along and he finally gets up and gets into the food. Of course, they can just come in from the other end, but they just haven't figured that out yet, okay? So lots of challenges, lots of unusual situations, little mazes for the dogs to problem solve, climbing up things, unusual surfaces, unstable surfaces, and changing. We change it around every couple of days. They come back in, they've been out for a little walk around or an excursion, and then they come back and everything is reconfigured. And they go, whoa, this is something completely new and novel. This wasn't here when I was here before, okay? So lots of stimulation, lots of variety, lots of exposure, okay? That's the secret. Not that hard to do. For those that are interested in, okay, so where does that sort of 12, 14, 16 week fit in? This is where it fits in in the new model. So this early period here, we've already talked about this primary period during super plasticity. This is still more plastic, this green area here, still more plastic than um, the dog would be at later stages. But you see it's dwindling down and it's going to be very hard to play catch up if you don't get it right. Now, I don't know whether you think it's a good thing or a bad thing that it's all in the hands of the breeder, you know. Um, to me, it's a good thing. We know now, we've got the prescription. We know what was causing the problem. We know how to fix it. We've got the prescription, okay? It's just like, um, you know, tetanus and um, and smallpox and everything. We know what caused it. We can fix it. it that's it. We, we can wipe it off the face of the earth. We can wipe fear, anxiety, and separation problems basically off the face of the earth um, by having a bit of genetic selection, but mostly 
starting and doing a lot more a lot earlier than we originally anticipated. This is the presentation that you should definitely watch from Catherine, okay? Don't worry about all this stuff now. It is on YouTube now. It, they've only just put it up to YouTube. It used to be on their channel for years, but um, on there, you had to go to their um, their website, but now the website doesn't have it. So this is actually not current, okay? But anyway, this is easy to find. Just plug that into YouTube or Google and uh, you should find it. Grab a snapshot. Nice presentation. You need to watch it. Okay, because it's got lots of graphs and charts. You can't just listen to it while you're driving the car. By the way, that place there, the Sparks Initiative guys, they have lots of great talks, okay, from a lot of great scientists and researchers and um, panel discussions and all sorts of really good stuff. Okay. Um, same, same again, guys, just more studies, okay, on the same sort of stuff um, on this early. Look again, three to five weeks is the time when we really should uh, hook in and get things done, okay? And again, from another one here, that three to five week period of the development forms the foundation for the whole sensitive period, okay? And that's why I'm saying most people don't think that. they. I mean, I'm saying that your real emphasis is around that three, four, five, six, seven week age period. Most people, that's almost off the radar, you know, without, they're not doing much in the way of conscientious stuff. They figure it's the, the, the heavy lifting is done later. They might be doing bits and pieces. I'm saying completely reverse that, okay? Say so that there's three, to, and I've got all the evidence in the world, all the research, all the experts, they're all supporting me, every single one of them. And let me just tell you, it goes back a long way. Friedman, 61. This guy was a researcher with Scott and Fuller in that same um, study, okay, they're, they're same, the Bar Harbor uh, Research Lab there, okay, same thing, dogs that are isolated up until 14 weeks of age could never remain, never regain socialization, could not thereafter be established, they could never do it, they spent a year trying to get the dog sociable after they isolated them, and it's not like they didn't get any socialization, they just, look, they were removed indoors at different ages, played with for a week and then returned to the field. Even in that circumstance, they had real problems. So they were just underdoing it. Too little, too late, okay? Key words here, guys, could not thereafter be established. Can't fix it. That's why it's the critical period, okay? You can't. You do not get a second chance. That's uh, Michael Fox that I mentioned quite a few times, okay? Not that you really care, guys, but even intelligence and problem solving and all of that is impacted by these same sorts of things. And that's Michael saying the same thing. A dog that has not been properly socialized or not sufficiently bonded with its owner in early life is often harder to train. Socially clear socialization clearly influences trainability. Now, trainability isn't our priority today, but still, if dogs are going to be rehomed, trainability is worth considering. Okay. And again, there's nothing extra you have to do. All the things I've been telling you take care of everything. You get better heart rates, better stress resistance, better immune systems, better socialization, better coping mechanisms, better, 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 better. Okay. It's just endless, the quality. Okay. So this is Patricia Princehouse um, talking about uh, the things, poor print of history there and saying, I'll let Patricia speak for herself quickly. Domestic, civilized dogs. It's the same thing. The puppy wakes up to the world at three weeks and begins to look around. But, you know, if you're just in the barn, there's not all that much to do if you've just got the puppies locked in a stall or in a doghouse out back, right? And so, again, for just like me, we do all these things. We take them to different surfaces. We take them to different rooms in the house. We let them smell things. We put different uh, things in the whelping box for them to be on. Uh, and especially as they get toward five weeks, we start taking them places. So. Uh, uh, there's always the concern that the puppy could be exposed to diseases. I err on the side of socialization, and my puppies at five weeks are going out places. There it is. And she's a, a quite famous scientist over in the US, okay? And um, plenty of early stuff. Domestics. That's the, uh, the secret. Okay. Um, still need to do a bit after that period. I've said this is where the heavy lifting, you know, we still want to get out and do, you know, go on excursions and give the dog new experiences and stuff. It'd be silly just to keep the dog locked up after doing all that early work. It's the heavy lifting, but it's not all of the lifting. Okay. We still got to maintain it. Um, okay. So um, again, more information, 
there. I've got, it's not in this presentation, but I have a whole presentation on homing age and the differences of dogs homed at uh, six to seven weeks of age versus after eight weeks of age, and then at 12 to 13 weeks of age and all the problems that are associated. But the main problems are increased fear and increased aggression. Um, with dogs okay and this is only one of many studies the relationship between aggression and avoidance behavior in dogs and their experience in the first six months of life but I've got ones that go right down to literally homing age okay so the difference between being home before eight weeks and after after eight weeks or 12 weeks etc okay happy to give you all of those that research and stuff okay this is that study that we were just talking about there okay um with our more contemporary and detailed understanding of the process and development and the young brain concept that the dog either has it innately or isn't is now in reality an unscientific perspective. That's reasonable when you're talking about racing, because I would agree with that in a racing dog or a sled dog or a herding dog. They've got the gift or they haven't. We all know that. OK, but that's not what we're talking about. Here. We're talking about socialization uh, and environmental enrichment, and that is largely about the environment particularly during the early periods. And I want to reiterate, the reason we didn't think that was the case is because we didn't understand how early we needed to start and how much we needed to do. We just simply had the timing wrong. Once we adjusted the timing, we went, wow, it's not about genetic fear. It's about we didn't do the right thing at the right time. Genetics, of course, plays a role in everything. I'm not, never denying that. OK, in fact, this is my genetics professor, Ralph Bealparts, OK, um, and he's retired now, but um, yeah, same thing. Specialization and the importance of experience I'm not going to go into here. That one here now. OK, OK, so pretty much question time. I'm going to put up three, three slides, guys, on um, with references. There are a load of them. So just take photos or something. I know you've got the video, but, you know, if somebody just goes to camera now and <clears throat> just takes a photo of the slides as they come up on the screen just so as you can capture all of the references okay because um, my references are pretty full on that's page one take it you've got that here we go page two bang and here we go page three Actually, two of these people, Harley and Shane just here, have joined us tonight. They've been part of it. So when, during question and answer, they may answer. There may be others on this list that are listening in as well, guys. So if you are if you are here, I apologise. But uh, all those people that we talked about, Kerry Ressler, world's leading authority on post-traumatic stress, <clears throat> et cetera, et cetera. Plenty of good information. There's the Sparks Initiative, guys. Society for Promotion of, apply, of Research and um, Promotion that, that should be applied research in canine science. Okay. Over to you guys. There, Kirsty. Sorry, yeah, I'm just asking the audience now. One of um, the people here wants to know uh, information about how to teach a dog to chase. So I guess prey drive um and doing that sort of stuff well <clears throat> I, i'm going to put prey drive in the same category as herding sledding and racing we breed for it okay you, it's not something you teach okay i'm sure that you do i'm not i'm no expert about greyhound racing at all guys okay so if i say anything or if i use inappropriate terminology forgive me it's obviously i can't be an expert on every single thing that dogs do and greyhounds is definitely not one of them so, um, but I'm sure you guys all realise the dog's either got the talent or it doesn't. And certainly your training and development is going to bring to light the talent, but it doesn't create it, okay? Um, the dog sort of has the gift or it doesn't. And chasing and the drive to chase and prey drive, we put in that same category. So we selectively breed for it. Um, you know, our dogs are very full on... Um, you know, uh, in that kind of drive type scenario. So um, I, I can show you drive type of things with our dogs, okay? So this would be a search and rescue dog, so for example. We've got our 12-week-old male pup here and we're doing some drive development 
activities with, the, with her. And the, one of the activities we're trying to develop here is that once, we, once the dog wins the game and gets the object or if we let we it go. We won't go into it in detail. We want to take some more questions and stuff. So, yeah. So we encourage and we play lots of these games. Um, <clears throat> the, the one thing I will say <clears throat> is that we... Um, We promote an interactive game. Lots of frustration. Frustration builds drive. And we don't encourage the dog to be motivated by the object. So a few we want the dog to. We're doing some work on the We want the dog to. Um, to play the game with us not be caring about the object. So if I let go of that object, I want him to be reorientating back onto me. I want the game to be with me. We call that high, functional, interactive, or more event. I'm showing him, so the mind's here. Hey, yes. Go back to Okay, and we do that over and over. So lots of frustration, lots of teasing. Once the dog gets it, it doesn't really build the drive. It's the teasing, and uh, we do a lot of that. And then training the dog, don't think about the object, think about the game. So as soon as the object is dropped, it's we call that the dead object. The dog basically gives it up. Now, obviously, that's just like a 13, 14 week old pup or something. So he's still held on a little bit. But as they mature, we work more and more for the dog to not care about the object and move back on us. That's how we do it for our work, whether it be search and rescue, detector dogs, police dogs, et cetera, all of those scenarios, it's much more beneficial to have this fire, functional interactive reward event. Okay. Means interactive with me. You can't play it by yourself because it's like playing Frisbee by yourself. It's not much fun. Next question. Uh, sorry, boy, just on that, would you suggest um, when the pups are quite young, getting them to start chasing a variety of different objects and things like that, then instead of just one, just for the reference? If you care about the... if. If you care about the grip itself, not just the drive, okay? So for us, we actually care about the fact that the dog um, holds on in a certain way. You can imagine for a police dog, he has to learn to bite properly. It's like teaching a boxer how to punch properly, if you know what I mean. Okay, like your dogs, they have to learn to race, run properly and stuff, okay? I don't know about what you do, but I imagine there are things that you teach a dog how to start faster and how to pace himself or whatever, I guess, you know? So we have... It's not just random how they bite. They learn how to do it like a boxer learns how to box, okay? Um, and so in that circumstance, we, when they're young, we have a whole range of tools, maybe about 50 different types of tugs and play games, you know, tug toys and things like that. Um, and we test to see which one the dog is most interested in and will has the best skills with. And then we evolve that over time, okay? So if he's more interested in one and he's doing in doing better with it, we'll work with that one to develop that skill set until he kind of grows out of it. Then we go to the next one. So that's from the Belgians. The Belgians were famous for selecting something that the dog likes and uh, that can make a big difference. So we're more concerned about building the motivation to engage in the game than we are about the variety of the things on the game. Having said that, at, you, you have to diversify at some point, but if you can build the drive to be so strong that eventually the dog just doesn't care one bit what, what that thing is. Okay, so watch this 12 week old. It's the same no, puppy. Just doing some enviro sensitization and drive development type exit activities. So you see, you know, we care about the grip. We don't just care about, um, you know, not, not about the game. But not everybody would care about that. Yeah. Some people would say, I don't care about the grip. I wouldn't care about it for a search and rescue dog, for example. As long as the dog wants to play, I could care less. If it lets go, as long as when it lets go, it stays in the game. You know, it doesn't wander off and lose interest and drop out of drive. Then, yes, we've got a problem. Boyd? Yeah. Uh, following on from that, you, you emphasize how when you're teaching the dog to uh, encourage drive, you want the dog to concentrate on you as, as the primary thing, that the, the toy is a way to a attract its attention and then used as a reward. For the greyhounds, it's the total opposite because what we want is the dog to absolutely concentrate on the lure 
and ignore everything else, such as other dogs or the crowd or the owner. So have you any suggestions as to how we could perhaps tweak that exercise? Sure. Um, the first thing I want to say is that it goes back to that plasticity, that super plasticity when they're young. So that's the time when you can orientate them the best one way or the other. So for example, if we don't do anything consciously about it with our dogs when they're young, let's say in the first three months up until say around 12 weeks of age, okay, we just nobody cares about it. They just play a game and the dog's allowed to run off with the tug and, you know, possess it. And, you know, we've all seen that. You play a game, you let it go and the dog runs off and bolts off and says, this is mine. And then maybe takes it away somewhere and starts chewing on it and things like that. Okay. So if we didn't care about it and we didn't manage it, most of our dogs would go down that path and be orientated that way. And they would become what we call object fixated, et cetera. Okay. So what I'm saying is that especially when the brain is plastic, this, this doesn't shut off at 12 weeks, but it's just going to be a lot of easier to be able to orientate the dog, to play the game the way you want it to be played. So what I'm suggesting is that the the drive, prey drive, if you want to call it that, hunt drive, whatever, okay, uh, that is largely inborn based on good genetics, okay? You're selecting for, I don't know how much your selection is for a dog that can run fast as compared to a dog that has a really high drive for the, for the prey, okay? Uh, I don't actually need to know that, okay? It's interesting. I'm interested in it, but it doesn't change my mind. Let me just give you an example. If we were talking about detector dogs, search and detection dogs, right? Sniffer dogs, okay? And you said to me, so Boyd, what's more important? How good is the dog's nose? Is he a good sniffer? Does he have a good piece of equipment there in it? And does he have a good nose? Is that the most important thing or is it the drive? Do you care about how much he cares about the ball that he gets for the reward? The answer is simple. We don't care about how good the nose is because they've all got great noses. It makes no difference. We don't even think about it, okay? All we care about is how obsessed that dog is for that ball, okay? Or whatever we're going to use for the reward, that tug game or something. Because if that dog is super, super motivated to get that reward, okay, then everything else takes care of itself, okay? So that's what we're breeding for. And nobody measures how good the dog's nose is. Now, that may be different with a greyhound because obviously you've got to, you know, all dogs have good noses, but not all dogs can run really fast. And your answer is probably going to be, well, we breed for both. But my real question is, yeah, but which one is the more important? You've got two dogs that you're choosing from, okay? One is a slightly fast racer, but the other one has loads more drive. Which one do you choose in the breeding program? And so that's the, the thing that I'm saying is about the genetics, okay? But what I am saying is that you can shape the way the dog plays with those things. So if I wanted to shape the dog having possessiveness, I would give the dog the object and I would run around with it on a string. So, you know, it's still connected between me and him like a ball on a string while it's a puppy. Okay. So I'm running around at eight weeks of age, ball on a string and teaching the dog that, that it's, it hasn't died. I'm still popping the string. You can imagine I'm running around with a bit of rope on the end of a tennis ball. The rope is like at least a meter or two long. And just when the dog thinks that it's going to be not very interesting, pop, I make it again. I keep it alive, if you like, like the rabbit is sort of pulsing, the heartbeat is sort of pulsing. And I do this artificial thing with a little pop, pop, pop. I don't have a video here that I can just quickly grab in a conversation. But um, Kirsty, if you want me to, I can flick you over a couple of videos, how okay. we could do that. We do circuit running and stuff like that. And let me just say, I'll just finish by saying, and I know a few of my guys will kill me if I don't say this, we do do that with some dogs when, guess what? When, when their drive isn't that great. So if we get a dog and he's a bit subpar, but we still want him to make it, okay? Uh, we have a German Shepherd like that at the moment, a fairly new dog to the program. And he, he, he ticks a lot of boxes, really nice dog, but mediocre drive, okay? And two people say to me when we took him, um, surprise you took that dog and uh, got some weird looks from the crew and stuff. But he had everything except his drive was only mediocre, okay? Um, and I'm probably being friendly there. Mediocre, you know, it probably wasn't even a five out of 10. So normally we would just dismiss that out of hand, okay? But he had some other traits and um, 
not all of the dogs we sell have to have super hard drives because sometimes they can be for other jobs because we're selling dogs and, and building dogs for assistance dogs for disabled and and uh, you know that type of things for search and detection across multiple different applications searching search and rescue explosives narcotics detection etc uh, also police dogs military dogs you know so if a dog doesn't fit into one category we can sort of shift him to another category but um, with that dog we won't care about the game. We'll do whatever it takes to build the drive. And if that means building possession and the dog obsessed with that ball or that object, that prey object, and he wants to possess it, he wants to carry it, he wants it, I'm fine. I care more about having lots of drive, but because with our genetics, like those videos you saw, okay, those are two dogs in our breeding program, they've got drive to spare. They never run out of drive. They literally will collapse. We, we have to stop to protect them from health. We had a bit of an incident just this week, actually, with uh, the father of that dog uh, that you just saw there, where he got, he was a warm day this week. We had a warm day and the dog uh, started to show a bit of fatigue at the end of it, a little like a mild level of heat stroke afterwards. Didn't even want to drink after a really hard workout. So uh, we probably pushed the envelope. We could kill our dogs with the drive, as I'm sure you guys could if, you know, if it was a hot day and you weren't managing it. I'm sure, you know, any of us who build high drive dogs, we know that we've got to manage that drive. We've got to look after our dogs. So, um, but if I get a low drive dog, I'm happy to build the possession and I don't really care. And I think it's just the way you engineer the exercise. Keep the game going, even when he thinks it's not going to end by keeping it on a string. So he wins it and then he starts to lose interest because there's no game, but then it moves again and then it moves again. And you can do that running in circles. You can do that when he's just standing there. Sometimes we'll just hold the dog so he can't even move around. He's standing still. He can't do anything. The object's still in his mouth. Let's say it's a ball or whatever you're using on a rope. Okay. Um, and there's two people. You've got the person handling the dog and the trainer. Okay. Like you saw in those videos and you know, wait a few seconds. It'll pop, pop. Wait a few. So just when the dog thinks, oh, it looks like it's dead. No, no, it's still alive. It's still going. And then the dog just possesses it and we create further challenges. So yeah, we sort of engineer it in to build the drive in one form or another. We prefer the interactive drive for our purposes and I fully respect that you don't. Um, and I'm a big advocate of training dogs to fit the application. So I totally get where you're at. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, come up, come up. I did say, Kirsty, that I can never answer a question quickly, okay? So, <laughs> uh, you get an answer in me under five minutes, it's a miracle. I was given a presentation to the German Shepherd Club, 120 people um, was in the thing. And out of that 120, there's probably about 20 people in the room who knew me and would listen to presentations from me before proper properly like this you know anyway there was we had like an hour for question time because it was a whole day seminar you know and about half an hour into it one of the people asked me a question and it, the question took about two minutes to ask it was quite a long question I'm listening patiently and at the end I just said no and that was it and 20 people in the room just started laughing they burst out laughing and other people in the room were laughing and uh, were looking at them going why are you laughing? What's funny? You just said no. You know, well, I'm, I'm missing the joke. And say, so, no, the joke is Boyd never just says no. He always explains int int you know, intimately why. I always feel like I under answer the question because it's complicated stuff. I agree. I, I'm not a person who says this is simple. Just get your act together. No, no, it's, it's technical stuff. You know, um, there's a lot to learn. Um, just quickly, are there any aspects of socialization that could have a negative impact on the dog? And what would you do to mitigate the risk of that? I think that's a, 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 a sort of a sector specific thing. So for example, if you continue to super socialize a dog with people, uh, you know, even well beyond 12 weeks of age with people picking up the dog, cuddling him and stuff like that, and then you wanted him as a police dog, that'd be counterproductive. So we monitor the dog between about eight or nine weeks of age up until about 12 weeks of age for a police dog. And then we wean off the human socialization. We still have the dogs around people but they don't handle them they don't interact with them so the dog get, so a dog could walk through a shopping center or a, or a you know a festival or a kid's fate or something and just be neutral around it i can walk through it but i don't expect to engage so over socialization outside of that early window when the bonding period happens could be counterproductive 
And I'd say to you that anything can happen like that. If you build too much drive in a dog and then it's going to go to a family environment, the dog's going to want to play tug of war and uh, and the family aren't going to want to do that. So you've got to kind of tweak your, uh, your protocols to fit your circumstance, okay? But um, I think from the environmental point of view, you know, we're talking about loud noises, unusual surfaces. I, I'd like to introduce a concept to you um, it's beyond the scope of what we're talking about here today, so I'll keep it extremely brief. Okay, so you'd be surprised how many dogs in the real world, from seeing eye dogs through to detector dogs with the um, with border force and the like, um, and and uh, police dogs, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, fail at one point or another due to relatively minor fear problems. Okay, sensitivities could be noises. Could be unusual surfaces, grates and grills and slip and slippery and slick surfaces and stuff and changes of surface, like in a house where it goes from carpet to tiles, you know, maybe in the kitchen or the bathroom. So a sudden change in the in the texture of the surface and the slipperiness of the surface, um, et cetera, et cetera. OK, so and, and the, these dogs are usually reasonably good. It's not like they're afraid all the time and they often you won't see anything for a week. But just in certain circumstances, those chinks rear their ugly head. And so if you want to take it all the way, and this is beyond the scope of today, to tonight's discussion, I totally agree, but I'll just say, what you've got to do is shift your, your mindset from saying, I'm not simply environmentally exposing my dog to noises and surfaces and different situations and stuff like that, okay? I'm actually conditioning my dog to accept novelty and the unfamiliar as being normal, as being the standard. OK, so you can take your dog out into the real world, into an industrial complex, into a busy city seat, street scene, uh, into a, um, you know, industrial complex, a school, a hospital, any sort of environment. The gurneys being pushed around, shopping centres, bunnings with trolleys moving around, industrial areas where machines are going and bangs and crashes are happening onto a work site. And there'll be things that he's never seen before. It doesn't matter how much work you've put in, there'll be something that he hasn't seen before. Noises, environments and everything like that, okay? You can condition a dog if you really work hard when they're young to say, I've never seen that before. That is completely new, completely novel, completely unfamiliar to me. But I am so used to seeing new, novel and unfamiliar things that they themselves don't concern me. And that's because dogs are genetically reactive to and sensitive to new, novel and unfamiliar. So we are trying to encourage people, both with our own dogs and with the, the agencies and organisations we support, that um, to learn to say, it's not enough to socialise them to the things that they've been exposed to. I want my dog to be conditioned to expect the unexpected and to not care about it. This is just another thing I've never seen. I don't care because I see things I've never seen before lots of times. And I'm not afraid of things that I've never seen or never experienced because I'm conditioned. So I'm actually, if you like, socialized to the unfamiliarity of things. So anything that's unfamiliar, I just don't care about, you know. Um, and that's a whole nother level than normal environmental conditioning. So for, but certainly for your seeing eye dogs, your assistance dogs, your police dogs, a lot of detector dog roles and stuff like that. That's what the aim is. And then you've effectively bomb proof them. They can't fail based on fear and reactivity. They can still fail on lack of drive or other things for sure, but at least you've put that one to bed. Um, just in, on the um, vein, I guess, if they were socialising puppies and they were starting to show fear to something when you were expose them to something new, what should they do in that situation? What approach should they take? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I, look, to be honest, it, there's a bit of expertise in that. It'd be like asking me if a dog's aggressive, what do you do about it? You know, it's not an easy question to answer. But the first thing I'll say is the real difference between amateurs and true professionals and experts in dogs is being able to work at the challenge point, okay? Um, so not too far, but not too low, okay? If you're too low, if you're working always inside the comfort zone of the dog, you really don't progress and you really don't develop the dog. And if you work too hard uh, and push it too far, you can build sensitivity. Instead of desensitizing the dog, you sensitize it. 
So the ultimate objective is to find the challenge point where the dog is a little bit outside its comfort zone, but not so much that it freaks out and it learns to deal with that little bit of stress. It's go, yeah, I was in stress the other day. Nothing bad happened. I was fine, you know, a little bit uncomfortable at the time, but nothing happened. So they get comfortable with the idea of being uncomfortable. Okay. And that, that builds resilience. Okay. You know, the old saying, anything that doesn't kill you makes you stronger. We don't want to go that far, but you get the point. Okay. You get used to stress by being exposed to stress. And, and when I say exposed to stress, stress makes you feel uncomfortable. It's challenging. Okay. But the more often that you do it at the right level, you get it. And the military even have a term for it. They call it stress inoculation. And they do it with soldiers to condition them to fight in real world environments. And, uh, you know, they put them in scenarios that are you know built to sort of mimic in a way real world environments as much as they can um, as a stress inoculation so when they get over there they're conditioned to the stress and I want to stress it's not about always removing the stress and just saying being there done that I don't care it's about saying I feel stressed but I'm conditioned to feeling stressed this is just another day that I feel stressed, okay? So when you jump in freezing cold water every morning, okay, it's not that the water necessarily feels warmer. It's just that your body gets conditioned to dealing with the stress, okay? And, um, you know, that stress conditioning is um, a really good sort of, I guess, idea that you can build around going forward. And so I'm not afraid to make the dog, take the dog outside of its comfort zone, but I don't want to push it too far. And that's a skill, you know, that's, that comes from expertise, you know? And so if you're going to get into the weeds with that, um, I don't want to make this sound like a sales pitch, but we run courses, you know, online courses and stuff like that for these types of things for people all over the place. And so get in touch with us and through Kirsty, if you're interested and you can have a look at what programs we've got coming up and um, you can learn more about these things in more detail. Any other questions, Todd? No, just one other thing um, I've got here is when to, when would you introduce like wearing collars and leads to puppies? The way I like to introduce a lead, I mean, you can put a collar on as young as you want, you know, who cares, you know, so you can have the puppy collar on the pup at four or five weeks of age if you want to. Um, the only problem is the other puppies will try and chew it off him sort of thing. But, um, you know, we take them on and off. Most most of us colour code our pups at some stage, you know, red pup and yellow pup and blue pup and stuff like that with some sort of collar around the neck. But certainly, you know, by six weeks of age, our pups are wearing collars on a regular basis. The way that I like to introduce the lead, a man's necktie, an old necktie, okay, nice and slippery, <coughs> tie it onto the collar. <coughs> it doesn't have to be the full length, nowhere near the full length. You can cut a tie up into about three and just tie it and let the dog tow it around and he'll trip on it and step on it, you know, because it's just tied to his collar, not around his neck. It's just tied to a flat collar, so it can't choke him. And he just gets used to having this thing trailing behind. He gets used to stepping on it. And uh, that just desensitizes them to wearing the collar and that way they never, sorry, to wearing the lead and that way they never fight the lead. But when you do introduce the lead, try to use it to take the dog to food and to things. And the, you develop a positive association very, very quickly. And we would normally have our pups introduced to the lead and be comfortable with the lead by six weeks of age. Definitely no later than seven weeks, because that's the time that we would like to rehome the pups around seven weeks. Now, having said that, there are people that we work with who would insist on having the pups earlier than that. They would say, you know, I, to me, that's too late for optimal. Um, and I'm fine with that as well. But by the time our pups are seven weeks, they're crate trained, they're uh, lead trained, they won't fight the lead, they'll happily walk with it. And um, you saw that pup that I was carrying earlier. So being handled, carried, transported, um, environment situations, you know, um, they've been out on excursions and all of that type of stuff. They're already pretty resilient and pretty worldly. And really, let's say a pup goes to its new home seven weeks, or even if it's eight weeks, worst case scenario, if the, if the breeder won't let it go before that time, it should walk into the new home and go, oh, another, another excursion. Cool. You know, I'm happy to go. But uh, the more, the better. Anything else from anyone? No? Does anyone who's like logged in on Zoom that's muted want to ask any questions? You're monitoring the the chat, aren't you, um, Kirsty? Yeah. yeah, no chat happening. Cool. Okay. I guess that might be it then. For a greyhound. Oh, hold on one second. Come up, Jason. Okay. You can repeat it, but for a greyhound, it's 
well, like three months before you can actually leave training because that's when you get the dog. So, okay. And I've found that three months is fine. Um, I we've haven't had a problem at all. We've just got um, Tom mentioning that if they get a dog later. Yeah, so I heard it. Yeah, I, I heard. Yeah, yeah, I heard it. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. yeah, fine. Yeah. I, I don't think that things like obedience and lead training uh, need to be done early necessarily at all, you know. Um, as long as you get sort of foundational ideas in the dog, if you know what I mean. So we don't start with formal obedience training when our pups are young for any role at all. We'd rather be building the things that really matter, you know, uh, the drive, like you saw in those videos, playing the games and things and the environmental exposure and enrichment and stuff like that. Um, we do a little bit of like attention exercises and maybe recalls and tracking a lure, just letting the dog, um, you know, follow around and um, chase after a lure, not relevant to you guys i completely agree but um uh but those are the kind of little sort of games and things that we would do with our um that we would do you know with our dogs and stuff like that so yeah so th th this would be the type of thing we would do with a young dog when we're developing we've got our now 14 week old pup here and we're just continuing our early development work in this case tracking the lure you know, that, that's the kind of things that we would do in, um, you know, when they're young. But we're not really concerned about any sort of formal training. I'll show you a video of a, a, a well-trained dog doing sort of technical work. This is a military dog, but uh, trained by us. So we're just doing some technical healing here, making life a little bit difficult for the dog. Got obviously all these people lying around. Zeus, while that's happening, can you grab your shaker on your right there and just give it a bit of a shake? For those that have done a bit of obedience, um, I just want to stress our, our stuff will probably look nothing like yours. This is pretty new sort of technology that most people haven't seen. So our dogs index on the man's leg, okay, with what we call hip handler index position. So we can work in the dark or even if the dog had a blindfold on or whatever, and the dog references by touching the man's leg, as you can see there. And the dog knows that that's the position it needs to be. So it really doesn't matter what position Darren moves into, where he goes or what he does, the dog just moves to that position all the time so the dog isn't thinking about healing the way you might think it's thinking about getting back to the right position so it doesn't really matter what darren does the dog just adjusts and moves back to the correct position all the time so he's moving the dog between the middle position can you go up the other end and do that facing me, please, mate? Or in the middle there, just in that middle so you spot? You see how the dog just facing indexes me? off his leg. Wherever his leg is, middle. that's where the dog goes. Heel. Middle. Good. And heel. just heel around again. Good. A few spins like you did before. Good. And a couple more over the top of the guys. Backwards and forwards. So you see there the environmental and a, and a down neutrality. The dog just doesn't care about whatever's around or what's happening. Nice. And just to show that it has nothing to do with the ball. Same dog. Moving around, guys. Move down. When he goes into that corridor, he'll you go put right the dog in that between his legs. Come back out again. Just check up that corridor. When he comes back out, he'll put the dog back on his side.
move across, guys. I'm sure you get the picture, yeah. So, um, you know, and, and believe me, that's low level stuff. I I can show you high level stuff where the you with it, literally doing that with live fire guns going off all over the place literally doesn't make any difference. The dog just the dog just doesn't care about the environment. It's just irrelevant. It's now has true neutrality. That's that extreme end of the type of thing that we're working towards. Obviously, you guys don't need that. And we just want to build dogs that are going to make good family dogs. My big tip start earlier than you think, do more than you think, find little challenge points, keep it moving, change the environment all the time, get the dog used to the unfamiliar, things are going to change, different environments, lots of different people, lots of different things. The more variety you can put in, the better off you'll get. One quick question, boy. So often um, in the industry, someone might purchase a greyhound that is older, maybe 12 months, sometimes over that, is there any, I guess, hope for people if that dog isn't necessarily chasing to build that drive? Would you just say it's like, I don't know, you've lost the chance if they haven't, if it hasn't happened in that rearing stage? Do you mean chasing to drive, like to race, yeah. or yeah. do you mean just to play a game? So basically chasing, so them to chase a lure around a track, for example. I, I, I would say... Or, I mean, I'm no expert on greyhounds, but I would be incredibly surprised if that was the case. You know, it, if it was one in a million, I'd be surprised. Okay, yeah. And so if it's, if it's not there at 12 months, I want to stress again, for specialist jobs, okay, police dogs, assistance dogs, sled dogs, racing dogs, herding dogs, that's what we breed for, okay? And we just hope that we get that right genetic combination, okay? As opposed to the confidence in the real world, which is largely environment. Genetics plays a role in everything. Environment plays a role in everything, absolutely everything. There is no such thing in my mind as a gen purely genetic or purely environment trait, but the percentages vary a lot, okay? So how sociable the dog is with humans and how sensitive it is to the environment, to noises and different situations and circumstances, that that is largely about the early environment. On the other hand, the drive and commitment the dog has to chase and play and stuff like that, that is um, largely about the genetics, okay? So uh, we're breeding for it. And, and even though you're breeding for it, as we all know, you don't get it 100% of the time or even close to 100% of the time, if the truth be known, okay? We're always breeding for it. So no, I don't, I don't think that you could... Um, you could you, you could expect to have a racing dog if it's not showing much at 12 months of age. I've got absolutely no magic potion there for you to magically build in the drive, you know. The, the, you know, I'll be honest, the only reason I could see that that could work and would be that if that dog was reared by somebody who had no intentions for racing and had never done anything and had basically suppressed the drive, in other words, they originally planned to have it as a family dog, why you'd buy a greyhound right off the bat as a family dog and then turn it into a racer is beyond me, but let's imagine it, right? A thought experiment. Um, I, and then, so they've done nothing. And then at 12 months, they started to build it and realised, wow, this dog had it all along. We just suppressed it and we just didn't bring it out, okay? Now, I mean, that, that's such an unlikely situation. I just can't even see it happening, but that's possible. We do see that with our dogs sometimes. You know, somebody buys a German Shepherd or something like that and then um, and doesn't do anything with it, just raises it a pet, doesn't have, you know, did, never any intention of it being a working dog. And then 12 months, 18 months age or something, um, the dog comes into a different environment or they decide they want to do something and you start working with the dog and all of a sudden you go, wow look at all this stuff, look at all this drive, look at all this energy. The dog is actually a ripper, but it was just sort of suppressed, okay? But if you tried to build it during that 12-month period and then you couldn't do it and then you expect that it'll either magically turn up or that some brilliant trainer will actually be able to bring it out in a dog, I don't think that's, that's I don't even think that's feasible. Any other questions, guys? Last call. No? All right. I think that's it for questions, Boyd. Cool. We'll wrap it up. Perfect. Thanks for your Thanks. time and attention, guys. Hope you got something out of it. Kirsty, I'll get some feedback off you in the next day or so if you, yeah. you know, let the people um, give you some feedback. Yeah. Hopefully we covered the main topics. And keep an open mind. If you feel like we didn't nail it with certain topics and we want to go again sometime down the track, we'd be more than happy to do it.
Okay, no worries. Thanks, Boyd. All the best, guys. Turn the video off, Kirsty. <laughs>